Welcome. This webinar is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, CFBNP, and VBA Office of Equity Assurance and Office of Chief Diversity Office. My name is Trulusta Pauling. I will be your moderator this afternoon. Everyone's phone has been muted. If you have a question during the presentation today, please type it in the Q&A box on the right of the screen. I will read the questions at the end of the presentation and the presenters will provide a response. The presentations will be made available to everyone that registered and joined this webinar today. This is a live recording. I would like to thank Mr. Nathan Manley and Ms. Cheryl Ross for this collaboration. We are grateful for your time today. But before we get started, I would like to introduce Mr. Conrad Washington, Director of the VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Mr. Washington retired from the United States Marine Corps with 20 years of active duty service with a combat tour in 2004 in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom II. Mr. Washington is a licensed minister actively serving in his faith. He received his master's degree of divinity in pastoral studies from Moody Theological Seminary. He also holds a master's in business management and a bachelor of science degree in education. Additionally, he is a graduate of VA's class of 2017 virtual aspiring leaders program. Mr. Washington. Thank you, True. I appreciate it. And thank all of you for joining us today once again. I know you had a lot of choices to join many webinars today, but we're glad that you stopped by the VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. As a reminder, we have three to four of these webinars each month on a wide array of veteran-specific topics. As this office was reestablished by the Biden-Harris administration through Executive Order 14015 on February of 2021, it's only fitting to have a topic that is in coordination with the Biden administration's whole of government equity agenda. So I thank Ms. Cheryl Rawls and Nathan Manley for taking time out of their schedules today as senior executives to share their knowledge. And I believe it will be very helpful to all of us. So thank you all for joining us and be blessed. At this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Manley, who will be presenting on VA equity plan. Mr. Nathan Manley is the acting chief diversity officer under the office of the secretary of the VA. Mr. Manley leads VA's efforts in implementing one of the presidential priorities of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. He is committed to delivering equitable results for all veterans. Immediately prior to this assignment, he served as the chief consultant to the deputy of the undersecretary for health, in which he played an integral role in the rollout of the electronic health record modernization efforts and in developing a sustainable Veterans Health Administration governance structure. Please see his bio on the screen for other key positions he has held at the VA. At this time, I give you Mr. Nathan Manley. Good afternoon, everybody. My name, um, as true just says, Nathan Manley. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, always love being able to talk about our VA Equity Action Plan, um, which is developed in response to an executive order from the Biden-Harris administration. Let's go to the first slide. Next slide, please. So I always start um, this presentation with, with focusing, us, focusing all of us on why we're here. So our mission here at the Department of Veterans Affairs is to provide world-class care and benefits to all veterans. Not some, not a particular group, not the majority group, not the minority group, rather all veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. And that means we're providing it to everyone, no matter what they look like, who they are, who they love, um, where they're from, how they identify, or any other characteristic where we put people into um, groups or demographics. We're here to serve every veteran that has earned their benefits here at VA. So earlier this year, we published our second equity action plan. Next slide, please. And this is my only last slide, so I'll be talking from this slide the rest of the presentation. Um, earlier this year, we published the Equity Action Plan, which is our second 
equity action plan um, here at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Our equity action plan is um, our guide to helping us ensure that what we're doing here at the Department of Veterans Affairs is equitable for all veterans for our mission space. So on this slide on the left, you see our, our mission up on top, which we just talked about. Um, you also see the pillars of our strategic plan, um, which we live by every day um, to ensure that we're, we're making great decisions and moving forward in delivering care and benefits to veterans. On the right side of the chart are the strategies that are in our VA Equity Action Plan. So the five strategies, benefits, health, access, economic security, and data. And I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time on each one of those um, to kind of give you a better idea of, of what's there. At the bottom of this chart are two links for you and the, the charts are, are available to you. Um, the first link is directly to our VA Equity Action Plan itself. So the plan is public. It's out on our VA website. Um, anybody can pick it up and read it. The other link is to our um, 22 to 28 strategic plan. Um, it also is available on our website and available for anybody to consume. So overall, um, in our equity action plan, we have five strategies. Each of those strategies have then things that we're tracking. So we've got 115 items that we are tracking. Um, those items include specific actions, they include long-term, short-term metrics, and they include engagement opportunities where we're talking to our partners and our stakeholders to ensure that we're staying on track and doing the things that matter most. Of the 115 things that we're tracking, um, so far 26 of them have already been achieved. So happy to report that so far. The first area, benefits, um, and you're going to hear a lot more about benefits from Cheryl Rawls, who is on the call with us. She'll dive deeper into the topic. Um, the benefit strategy is all about improving outcomes for, for veterans by removing barriers um, for our underserved eligible, uh, eligible veterans as they're seeking disability compensation. So in this area, it's, it's all things benefits. We're tracking 21 different action, 21 different items. Two of those are already complete. Um, the benefits area is the area where we have, where we're the, the youngest, I should say, in maturity from an equity perspective. So the office that Cheryl leads was just stood up. Um, and so they're, they're going through the, the normal things that a brand new office has to go through. Gathering all the data that's out there, um, looking at all the reports that have been written, trying to figure out which specific areas were impacted by the report, which, which areas were looked at by that report figuring out where they have gaps in data, where they may not have looked at different things, trying to put processes in place um, and standardizing how they do business, um, and then figuring out what additional engagements have to happen to fully understand if we're delivering benefits equitably across the department. The next strategy, on the other hand, is all about health. So the health strategy is all about removing um, health barriers, or health, health disparities, to ensure that high quality care is received by all of our veterans that use VA for their health care. This office, um, so the VHA, the Veterans Health Administration, has had a health equity office for quite some time, um, a, a very mature organization where they are routinely looking at different topics to understand why there's a disparity in the way that um, out, the, the different outcomes that are received by, by veterans um, and trying to um, parses out, remove the barriers so that every veteran receives um, equitable health care. In this area, we are tracking six, 16 different items. One item has already been completed. Um, and really, they're focused on a couple of actions this year very specifically. Um, so one of the things that we know influences health outcomes for veterans is the social needs that go around healthcare. So things like food insecurity, housing, utilities, transportation. And so one of the things that the, the Veterans Health Administration is focused on this year is standardizing how we assess the social needs, um, social determinants of health that impact veterans. Um, and then what we do when we find that a veteran has needs that are not, currently not being met. So if there are food needs where they're not getting proper, the veteran is not, not getting proper nutrition or they have housing needs, utility needs, whatever that need is, um, what are we doing to address it? And so that's a huge focus area this year. 
They're also um, taking a different approach. Instead of trying to attack um, equity in and of itself, they're building equity into their quality improvement processes. So as a healthcare system, they're continually looking at their processes to ensure that the process is efficient and delivering for the outcome that's needed for, for the veterans that are part of that process. So instead of looking at equity separately from that process, um, because they're already a process-driven organization, they're building health equity um, into the quality improvement process. Um, and so that, that's one of the big focus areas that they're focused on for this year. Strategy three then is all about access. Um, so it's getting to all veterans to ensure that those that are eligible know that they're eligible and actually come in and, and get the benefits and care that they that they have earned. In this area, we are tracking 35 different actions um, because it's spread across so many different organizations that, that reach out and ensure that veterans um, are getting the word to come into VA. Six of those have been achieved. Um, and a couple of those I'm going to highlight for you. So the first one, we put a lot of energy this year into what we call the Veterans Experience Action Center. If you haven't experienced one of these yet, um, it's, it's, a, it's a new way that we are approaching veterans so that we're giving a veteran a, what we call a one VA experience. In our past, what we've done is gone out as separate administrations and talk to veterans about the services we offer. And so if you're veteran healthcare and you're going out talking about healthcare, if you only talk about healthcare, a veteran's only going to get a small piece of the pig, of the pie, right? They first need to go through benefits so they can get a benefits determination so they can then get healthcare. What we're now doing with our one VA experience is we're combining all the administrations together when we go out and talk with veterans. And so we we have these things called Veterans Experience Action Centers, where we bring in veterans benefits, veterans health, the cemetery administration. So that no matter what the what the question of the veteran is, we're able to address it with having expertise there um, to answer the questions, and more importantly, to take a claim from a veteran for benefits or to enroll a veteran um, into healthcare. Um, under this strategy, we're also focused on um, surveying veterans to ensure that we're identifying gaps where there are gaps that are out there. Um, we're using human centered design to look at our processes and ensure that. Um, we're delivering on processes and delivering processes that are focused on that veteran um, and delivering the care that they need. This strategy also has established in the Center for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Health. Um, this is a new center that is out in Hawaii. It opened up just a few weeks ago um, to focus on unique challenges that are that are um, experienced by our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Um, in addition, the cemetery. Um, administration has an action item in here to ensure that they are putting cemeteries um, in places where veterans are located um, so that their families and loved ones um, do not have to drive for hours and hours and hours to pay their respects um, after they've passed. The fourth strategy then is on economic security. This is all about making sure that the money that we're sending out to um, contractors um, is done so in an equitable manner. We're focused on small disabled businesses, women owned small businesses, and hub zones. Um, this, this area has, or the strategy has 21 items we're tracking, 10 have already been achieved. Um, and it really involves a lot of actions around outreach to small, small disadvantaged or small disabled businesses, women owned small businesses, and hub zones to really educate them on how do they, how do they position themselves so that when contracting opportunities need to be fulfilled, that they're able to um, get those opportunities. And so there's a lot of education that is focused in that area to help those, those businesses um, understand our procurement process. We're also, that, uh, that area is also focused on forecasting um, so that we do a much, much better job of allowing industry to understand where the department's headed into the future. And so if we're expecting to do something two or three years from now, allowing industry to understand where, where we're going in two to three years um, helps the, the industry partners then posture themselves and prepare themselves for work that could be coming their way. We're also doing a significant amount of internal training there to um, open the eyes of our program managers that require contract support um, to ensure that they understand the capabilities of specifically the women-owned small businesses, hub zones, and um, 
small disadvantaged businesses. The last strategy then is all about data. And so using data to help inform and, and make um, evidence-based decisions is what we want. What we have um, is three administrations that have grown up over time, um, have grown up stovepiped and have their own sets of data um, and did not have data standards or, or um, ways of doing business that we can look across the department and make sense of the data we have. And so that has been maturing over time. We've got 16 items we're tracking in this area. Three of them are complete. Um, this strategy is all about issuing standards so that we start collecting data in the same way um, so that when we need to talk to the different administrations, we're able to do that. It's also about improving our data quality um, so that we're, we're operating on true data and not some assumptions that somebody made along the way. And finally, it's about figuring out how to share that data so that from a veteran perspective, they're not, have to, not having to answer demographic questions every time they come in for a visit because they've answered it one time and we're able to share it across the entire entirety of VA. In a nutshell, that is our overarching um, VA equity action plan. We are halfway through um, this execution and we've already begun the process of looking at what our 2025 plan will be. Um, and so we expect, um, in, you know, improving and ensuring equi equity for all veterans um, is something that will take a while. And we're going to make um, every step we can to improve things along the way. With that, I'm going to hand it off um, to my colleague, Cheryl Rawls, who will do a deeper dive into benefits. Thank you, Mr. Manley, for that very important presentation. Next, I would like to introduce our second presenter for today. Ms. Cheryl Rawl, who will be speaking to VA Equity Action Plan. Ms. Rawls was appointed as Executive Director for the Office of Equity Assurance on December 3, 2023. She is responsible for assessing VBA's programs, processes, and procedures to promote benefits equi equity for families, ve veterans, survivors, and caregivers. She represents VA and serves as liaison with other governmental and non-governmental organizations working on achieving benefits equity. She champions efforts to address equity through education, training, studies, and initiatives to bring synergy throughout benefit delivery. Please read her bio on the screen for other positions she has held. At this time, I give you Ms. Cheryl Ross for the last uh, presentation for today. Ms. Ross. Well, thank you so much, True, for that warm uh, introduction. And hello to everyone. Um, if there was anything I would want to add, I will tell you that I've been with the VA for 28 years. I have served in the military um, for a little less than uh, 10 years. Uh, I deeply cherish this partnership with the faith-based community. Um, hopefully, this is not the first time that I've had a, an opportunity to engage um, with you all. Um, hopefully, I've engaged with you while I was serving in, in different roles. And of course, I look forward to continuing um, this partnership. So, you know, Nathan talked about the um, equity uh, activities from the department level. Uh, my goal today is to talk to you about what VBA uh, is doing in that arena. Next slide, please. All right, so this new office, the office was established in April of 2023, but I took over in December uh, of 2023. So, you know, I have about seven months uh, in the job and it has been a really quick learning curve to get everything going. As Nathan, Nathan said, we are monitoring um, many, many, many different projects. Um, this office is outward facing. So we are looking at how we can improve our um, delivery of benefits to all our veterans that have earned uh, these benefits. And as Nathan stated, remember the Veterans Health Equity Office, they have been in existence for about 10 years. 
we have been working um a, a, as i mentioned since april so we are certainly learning from them uh as we are beginning uh to run you can see what this mission uh consists of and just a reminder of all of the benefits that vba delivers you have your compensation you have your pensions there's loan guarantee there's vocational readiness and employment and of course um, one of the areas that i just finished working in the transition assistance programs so we're looking across the entire spectrum to ensure that we have removed any real or perceived barriers within the delivery of benefits in Veterans Benefits Administration. When crafting the vision, I thought it was important that we were inclusive of people, processes, and technology. People from the aspect of what training do we need to provide our decision makers? Does that training need to consist of unconscious bias training, um, cultural competency training, and how often? When talking about our processes, we have to look to see if we are establishing barriers when we are setting up our processes. We've had lots of conversation and we're still working on how to overcome some of the things that we're asking our newer veterans to produce when they don't have a need to have it like a checkbook. Some of our um, processes require them to give us a canceled check. And our newer veterans are like, what are you talking about? I don't do any banking with paper. We, I do all my banking electronically. So VA, you need to catch up. And then when we're looking at technology, it's, it's so important for us to remember that we have veterans that continue to struggle to pay for technology, but yet we're still saying you need to have this in order to get in contact with us. Or we are saying, hey, scan this QR code. And we are not thinking that they may not have that technology to be able to scan that code or to be able to pay for something uh, as a QR code scanner. So it was really important um, for us to take a look and integrate that into our mission and vision statement. Next slide. Now specifically, what is it that consists of VBA's equity assurance plan? There are seven strategies. And this is on top of the strategies that Nathan talked about that are de the department level. We're feeding into those strategies, but being very, very specific about those things that we are taking on. So I wanna spend a moment and just kind of go through these. The first strategy, of course, um, is kind of easy to get into the organizational structure. Well. We said, hey, we need an office very similar to the Office of Health Equity. And so let's stand up our, our Office of Equity Assurance in VBA. I have three different uh, modalities for delivering services. One, I have a research arm. Um, two, I have an engagement arm. And then the third is around project management. So we've been very careful about how we structure the office to ensure that we are integrated. And please know that this office reports to the chief of staff, which is the chief of staff for VBA, which is directly under the undersecretary for v VBA. So we have the level of over over site that we need and engagement. Strategy two, the customer experience. So we've been uh, working with VEO and we will continue to work with VEO in doing um, qualitative research, getting out there, talking to people, doing the human-centered design, 
and that's on the horizon, but we are also taking advantage of the work that VEO has already completed. They have conducted studies uh, around women veterans. They have conducted studies uh, around um, connectivity for the LGBTQ community and minority. So our first lay of the land is to explore those items out there while we are constructing the type of engaging studies that we need to do from a qualitative perspective. Training and quality control requires us to work with those executives that are over um, compensation and pension and looking at what um, training we need to provide for those decision makers, as I mentioned, and how often we need to provide and sharing any information or analysis that we have conducted about what our veterans need. Strategy four, data collection um, is huge for us in looking at how VBA um, collects information, how we recall that data, and how we synthesize that data. We are continuing to make sure, as Nathan mentioned, we are aligned with all of our data collection processes, and we need to make sure that, you know, the nomenclature actually makes sense of when we are recalling the data. Outreach, uh, as he uh, mentioned, we are continuing to work qualitatively and engaging people and looking at areas that we need to be uh, on the ground uh, in engaging with people. We most recently conducted an economic development initiative in uh, Memphis. And, you know, you would say, well, Cheryl, they have a regional office, but that regional office is all the way in Nashville. So it was important for us to deliver a one VA experience for them through um, consecutive days where we could work with the local stakeholders. Uh, and at this point, it was held at a local mega church, and we could bring in all of those decision makers so we could connect people to their benefits on the spot. And it, we actually provided exams. We probably will go back to this area in um, the next year to see how this community is doing. And then um, strategy six that deals with um, policies. We're continuing to look to see how do we be more inclusive? Uh, what are the items that we can work with our stakeholders and Congress to, to put out there? Uh, and this also kind of blends into strategy seven when you start looking at the historical inequities and recognizing them in, in a manner where it is not accusatory, but it is acknowledging and being able to talk about things such as redlining or talk about things such as um, blue discharges where veterans were just uh, dismissed for no um, good reason, maybe because of your race or because you were a member of the LGBTQ community and looking to see if there is anything that we can do to help you get reconnected to those benefits. So these seven strategies are certainly connected to our overall mission uh, at VA. Um, next slide, please. So what have we been engaged in? Well, our Benefits Equity Action Plan to date has led us not only to start collecting uh, data and looking at some of the studies that are already out there, but across the VBA to include our Office of Performance Analysis and, and Integrity, we've actually conducted a number of studies. And this is very pioneering for us. This is not a normal place for VBA to be in because what we are known for is distributing those benefits getting you um, into um, a, a home, 
making sure that when and if you have trouble, we are able to wrap our arms around you, you know, with that mortgage that you have. Um, we're, we've been focusing on getting as many claims out the door as possible. So we have not, and this is certainly hasn't been our strong suit in actually taking a look at, are we distributing these benefits free of disparities and biases, whether that is of a nature of uh, the percentage of a claim that you're getting um, paid for, whether that is around the time it has taken us to process. Is there a differences between the time it's taken us to, for women or men, blacks or whites? And we certainly have quality measures in place, but we just haven't been focused on the um, getting this type of reviews conducted. And so taking a look and doing our own quantitative research based on the data that we have is pretty new um, for us, but we are in and we are continuing to learn and to take advantage of all the opportunities to look at ourselves and report them. Um, the uh, studies are co conducted internally, but we also have had studies that have been done by others, such as the GAO study. And the significance of the GAO study certainly is around looking at a larger set of, of claims. And we're working to complete some of the items that were recommended in that GAO study, such as doing equity dashboards and continuing to do outreach. If we could go to the next slide, I'm gonna dive in a little more on these studies. So, as I mentioned, VBA, um, we're getting in and wrapping our arms around this. Um, on February the 14th of this year, 2023, uh, as Nathan mentioned, we released our equity plans and our equity action plans. But embedded in those plans, hint, hint, was a two-page summary of all the items that we were going to be engaged in in VBA as a response to our findings in our an, um, analysis of ourselves. And this was around the mental health compensation and benefits. So we actually hired a contractor to come in and look at hey, are we distributing these benefits uh, equitably between Blacks and whites and everybody else? And, and what we um, discovered was if you filed your claim for mental health sooner rather than later, the sooner is within the year, then that disparity between Blacks and whites was minimized. However, if you waited until you had been out of the service for more than a year and filed your claim, that disparity reappeared. And what that meant for us was that we needed to start looking at what is going on and peeling back to say, why is this uh, um, happening and how can we get this information out there um, to everyone? Uh, the study that was conducted in the, um, fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23, it was a continuation of us really dipping our toe into looking at this for PTSD in the earlier years of 17 and 18. And what we learned, we kind of recrafted things in 19 and started to put forth studies around all mental health. And so that's how we came up to the mental health items. Now in July, while we were doing our research, GAO did their research. And as I mentioned, 
Uh, one of the recommendations from GAO was, hey, VBA, we need you to complete your equity dashboards. And of course, we said, yes, we would. But GAO also said, VBA, we did this, but we need you to pick up these pieces and continue to study based on the parameters that we conducted our study. So that is one of the items that is on deck for my office to do, and that is to continue this study with um, GAO's parameters. Um, I've already mentioned that we release uh, the equity plans and uh, the, the need for a research arm is very, very strong for us because what we noticed not only was GAO out there studying us, but we had all sorts of think tanks requesting our data and then asking um, us for more data and then telling us what they think about our data. And we said, oh, you know what? We need to get um, ahead on board in tune in sync and be able to quantitatively review our data and make recommendations as well as to look to do some qualitative research and get out there uh, and talk to people. So that's where we are. Um, next slide. Now, outreach is so huge. You can say outreach, you can say engagement. Um, I always like to use engagement. It just sounds a, a, a little more um it, it, like you're really looking to ach achieve something at, at a specific um group and what i wanted to share with you was just a little bit around what we have been um engaged in so far now having an opportunity to talk to all of you i I'm hopeful and, and I'm always very intentful on actions. I'm hopeful that this information will make you go, hmm, is there a way for us to partner or is there any, inform any additional information that we need? And I would love for you, you know, to think through that and then to, to reach out to me. We're continuing, you know, to hit those areas that we are most comfortable with and that we know of. So, of course, we are doing roundtables and partnering with the Department of Labor. We're engaging our veteran service organizations. You know, we're speaking to um, veteran minority groups and doing symposiums. We're doing all of that. But I most recently, and then I kind of touched on this, um, the Undersecretary, Josh Jacobs, and I went to Memphis and we did a listening session. Uh, you can see which church um, we did this in. And because of that listening session, our Undersecretary, Mr. Jacobs, said, you know, we need to do more for this community. And that's how the Economic Development Initiative was born, looking to see that this community had enough veteran service officers that were willing um, to help and to be uh, available, ensuring that the regional office had the funds necessary to travel from Nashville to be able to take care and, and see individuals and making that connection with the regional office. So the director there, uh, Mr. Charles Moore, it, he was available and you could see the bonding already starting just with those three days with this is your senior benefits officer that is in your state that is here for you and you, you need to be able to reach out to them and be able to talk to them. Uh, we're certainly uh, partnering with internal groups, affinity groups, uh, such as big and few, and we are uh, on deck uh, to continue to engage with the NAACP and just be able to say we're, we are doing this research and we want to uh, invite 
people to understand what we're doing and why and what we're looking at. And we're also engaging um, entities such as the Urban League uh, because we're such a new organization. All right, next slide. So for us, um, um, ooh, is this the next slide? I think I want, yes. So what's on the horizon? Um, for us. Um, I, I've mentioned that we will continue to engage, but one of the neatest things that we've been able to um, complete, and I, I will say that first bullet um, is done. Uh, I like check marks because you know, I'm prior military. So we created the um, Equity um, Leadership Collaboration Council. My team still tries to get me to call it the elk. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll see what I can do. But the beauty of this council is that it, it um, consists of field executives and headquarters executives within VBA, as well as some executives that are at the department level. And, and what this organization's mission is to uh, complete is to make recommendations to the undersecretary for benefits on equity items that we should champion. And so why is this so important? Well, I um, mentioned I served 28 years uh, with VBA. More than half of that was as a regional office director at various offices and getting the input from the regional office directors and getting all of our leaders on board with what we need to do is the best way to set the stage and let the employees know that we are in this for the long haul to get in, in effect change. And so this... Um, Charter uh, was signed in April of 2024. Um, I am the chairman. Uh, there are 11 executive directors, and we have a representative from the Center for Women Veterans and the Center for Minority Veterans. So this has been and will be um, a very um, important uh, group, um, not only for VBA, but also I think items that will come out of VBA and be on the radar um, for big VA. Our first meeting is scheduled for tomorrow. Um, I've already provided them um, with reading assignments. I think our first reading assignment is around uh, the health equity, diversity and inclusion, uh, context, controversies and solutions. Uh, and so we're getting the team um, ready. Uh, we've met and um, informed the team during one of our senior leader meetings, um, the, the expectations, and they have the charter. So right now is all about just getting the work going. And we are very, very excited uh, that we are able to kick this off tomorrow with the undersecretary uh, Mr. Josh Jacobs um, opening this up. So again, check and done. We are certainly continuing to engage with our external um, stakeholders. Uh, the White House uh, is uh, there, certainly those uh, the individuals that we we need to ensure they understand what we're doing because after all, a lot of our activities are um, coming from executive orders uh, that the White House has put out. And so we are continuing to be aligned with all of the other federal agencies. We're um, hosting um, veteran-centric roundtables. Uh, we wanna know, you know, under our qualitative studies, we wanna know um, what is going on. Uh, and what their needs are and how we can do and be quicker. Um, for us developing our detailed plans, we are still working through that. There are several items in the department's plan as well as uh, in, in the um, benefits 
administration's plan that calls for compensation to take a deeper dive into several different areas. Uh, and so we're looking forward uh, for that. And uh, we're continuing to engage employees uh, within the organization to make sure that they understand the role of this office. You know, there are so many other activities. I mean, we're, we're setting up a way for veterans to get to us if they, if they feel that something has um, gone wrong with their claim and it is, it is in the equity area so we can be able to track those. And we're going out and, and making sure that people know about the office. And hence, I'm so appreciative of uh, the faith-based community, again, for allowing us to come and talk uh, about this. Um, all, all in all, we have close to, you know, Nathan said there's some 60 items. I would add, we probably have uh, the majority, no wink, wink at all um, of those items because we've also added some from our internal um, equity action plan uh, that spans uh, annually um, awesome. And so we're continuing to make those adjustments. And, and I know this community will send us some ideas and places. We're partnering with HBCUs. We're also partnering um, again with um, our um, VSOs. And I would be remiss if I did not mention our biggest partner, and that is the Department of Defense. Next slide. I wanted to make sure you had sources of, you know, the why. Um, I get a lot of questions. So why is your office here? What is going on? So you can kind of look at um, Executive Order 13985, which really speaks through um, the underserved communities uh, and uh, Executive Order 14091. Uh, and, and laying out some of the things, and Nathan has already given you the links um, to the VA Equity Action Plan. And in that, uh, when you get there, you'll have access to the VBA Benefits Equity Assurance Plan. And with that, uh, I think it brings us the questions. Uh, it was a fast 50 minutes, and you can see the contact information. So true. Uh, and or uh, Mr. Washington, I will turn this back over to you for questions. Thank you, Ms. Ross, for your presentation. That was a wealth of information and we're, uh, I learned so much today about what is going on. Um, we do have a few questions in the Q&A box and I will go ahead and get started with those. Our first question comes from Anthony DeLucia. And he said, I talked to a veteran who is in recovery and is homeless, but is in a domiciliary. He wants a career in psychology. Bravo. I invited him to our meeting with colleagues in North Carolina. I invited him knowing that he was using movement as medicine as part of his self-efficacy. I invited him to join us not to put him on display, but to un understand an important, uh, important narrative. Am I naive or not? That is the question. So I'll, I'll take that one, Cheryl, if you like. Um, awesome. So Anthony, first off, thank you for the question. Um, thank you for billing, being willing to help a veteran that's, that's in need um, when we have veterans that are in recovery, that are homeless, um, they have unmet needs that, that we need to take care of. Um, given the, the veteran is in the domiciliary, they have services that are wrapped around them. So VHA provides lots of different services. Um, and as part of the, the exit strategy from the domiciliary, there's always a plan in place to ensure that a veteran is taken care of once they, are, once they do leave the facility. Um, I would encourage that anything that you're offering um, that the, the veteran incorporate that into their plan going forward, that they discuss that with their, their, their providers, their social workers, their doctors, you know, all the different folks that are surrounding them um, to ensure that, you know, whatever the plan is going forward is, is the best thing for the veteran 
so they can still get their, the care they need um, and all the other services that are important to them. So thank you for being willing to, to, to help. Um, I would just ask that you make sure that the veteran include that as part of their care plan. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that, that question. And thank you, Mr. Manley, for that response. Our second question comes from Angela. What resources are available for a veteran who doesn't have a smartphone, so cannot access personnel records? Access requires identity verifications via QR code. Um, and I will take that one. So when we start looking at it for VBA, it is uh, other than visiting the regional office, um, there is going to be more of phone or call a friend that you give access while you're talking to them uh, or setting up that account. It, it is one of these items that we know we certainly need um, to provide more assistance. And what we have looked at and our partners for stepping up in that area in working with a, a an accredited veteran service officer, um, they will certainly um, put in um, to be able to look at your records and then you they and they're usually in the community, whether that is a um, um, a CVSO or a VSO, and they can also be found at the hospitals. They can help you see what's in your record uh, if you don't have that technology. So if you can't visit the regional office, um, certainly seek out a, an accredited veteran service officer and how will you know if someone's accredited um we actually have the ability to check a list for you uh if you have someone in mind and you can always call um va at our 1-800-827-1000 number and get some assistance so that that was a lot there's so many different area um avenues if you do not have the ability to use, uh, you know, the electronic way for contacting us. Thank you, Ms. Ross, for that response. Third question is coming from Trevor. Is there a congressional liaison at the VBA EO? One, I'm, I want to make sure I, I understand. Is there a congressional liaison at the Veteran Benefits uh, Administration? In in the office of equity assurance, or I don't. Um, he didn't. He just said EO. Okay. So, All right. In so, uh, um, so so uh, in the th then I will use EO as executive order. He just updated the question. He said, "Is there a congressional liaison at the VBA EO?" Sorry, he apologized for the last one he sent. Mr. Walters, I did not quite get that. I said that he said, is there a congressional liaison at the VBA EO? And he apologized for his last question. If that makes the question understandable. Um, I, I'm going to take a stab at it. And so the, the congressional liaisons um internal to VBA um are all centralized out of um the office of the undersecretary and they work throughout all the business lines and staff offices. Um we do engage the congressional liaisons for our state and um federal representatives uh, in, in letting them know what we are doing, but they're, they don't have one assigned um, other than, you know, through that engagement. And, and I'm, I think that's um, about what I can say. If there's any more clarity on that, I'll be more than happy to give it another shot. Thank you so much, Ms. Rawl. We are running out of time now. We are not unable to get around to all your questions today, but we do have them 
We have your name, your email address, and we will get the questions to Ms. Rawl and Ms. Uh, Ross and Ms. Mr. Manley to get a response back to you very soon. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Mr. Washington for closing remarks. Yeah, well, thank you. I thought we can get a couple more questions in from, from Ms. Rawls. She seems like she's excited about answering the questions. <laughs> okay, then we can get two more questions in, if you don't mind, Ms. Rawls. Maybe, maybe one from, more. One more, if that's okay. We have a question from Yolanda Echoes. Are will your department slash program partner with 59C3 nonprofits who are dedicated to helping veterans and their families? So, so the short so, answer is yes. The, the long answer is we continue to work with those established MOUs and MOAs um, with the department. But if we do not have an MOU or MOA with you, I know the organization that can help establish it. So that's why I gave you the short answer. And Cheryl, I would add to that that 501c3s are generally also able to compete for grants. And so I would encourage you to watch the grant opportunities that are out there. Um, and if it if it's something that's in your mission space, um, certainly submit submit a request, um, you know, submit a proposal for the grant. Thank you so much, Mr. Manley and Ms. Ross, for your presentations and your wealth of information today. We certainly so. Uh, are appreciative and grateful for your time. If you registered for this event, we would provide you with today's presentation. The presentation will be provided on our website at a later date. Please subscribe to our website and Facebook for future webinars and sharing of information. This adjourns today's webinar. Thank you for joining us today and goodbye. <laughs>